Interests include radiology of the acute abdomen, hepatobiliary imaging, and colorectal cancer screening. Dr. Poulos is the founder and executive director of the Stanford Medicine Abilities Coalition, also known as SMAC, a group composed of people with disabilities and their allies at Stanford Medicine. He's also a member of the radiology department diversity committee, the School of Medicine Faculty Senate Subcommittee on Diversity, and the School of Medicine Diversity Cabinet. One fact you would not know just by looking at him or listening to that bio is that he's also one of the mentors for the LEAD program, which is Leadership and Education and Advancing Diversity. And we are on that together. So thank you very much, Dr. Poulos. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, you everybody, for coming. I very, very much appreciate it. I'd like you to pretend that I'm strutting around giving a TED Talk, which I'm not going to do. I'm going to sit down in a minute because I can't think and talk and stand at the same time. The standing takes a little bit uh, too much cognitive effort. Don't worry, I'm not going to fall. Not yet. All right, I'm just going to put this crutch down. Had to stand up for at least like five seconds of this talk. So anyways, I'm going to be talking about um, disability as diversity in healthcare and um, some principles of creative inclusion. So just briefly, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my journey, which is something I really haven't shared before outside of some small sessions with the medical okay. students who are starting their clinical clerkships. Um, I'm going to talk about disability as diversity and then, of course, creative inclusion. What I'd like you to do at this point is if you could just close your eyes and picture that you're in a hospital and I want you to envision a doctor, conjure up an image of a doctor and picture you know, what that person may be doing um, and just hold that thought for a minute and, and remember what the first thing was that popped into your mind. So this is me in um, 2003. I got really kind of uh, overweight in my internship. There are too many donuts at like three in the morning in the emergency department. And I had to figure out a way to uh, lose some weight. So cycling was how I did it. I lost like 50 pounds and I felt great. It was awesome. I really enjoyed cycling. Um, stressful and I was using the exercise to manage my stress. Um, I should have been sleeping more instead of cycling less, but I didn't really realize that at the time. Um, this photo here is of uh, me and John Sello. Um, this was the January 4th, 2003, the day before my spinal cord injury. Uh, he had a New Year's party at his house. I'm having a caffeine-free Diet Coke there. Uh, there was nothing else to drink. Um, as most of you know, who know me, I prefer Coke Zero and from the faculty lounge. So um, anyways, you know, I was actually on call this day. I got called into the hospital. There was a GI bleeder in the ICU. Um, he had cirrhosis and varices. And uh, we went up there to scope him. And I was actually, this was like six months into my fellowship. And I was able to do the case entirely by myself. Um, you know, able to go down and, and uh, put uh, rubber bands on the esoph esophageal varices and stop the bleeding. And I was feeling really great about that. You know, you spend a lot of time your first year of GI fellowship just feeling inadequate because you like can't finish the colonoscopy or you fumble this or that. But like I really, so I feel like I, I made strides. And the next day I went to the hospital and rounded. We had very few patients on the service. And so I got out around 10 a.m. And I said, oh, I'm going to go for a little bike ride. And uh, just one hour, boom, uh, you know, straight out to Marin Headlands and back. So um, it was a beautiful sunny day, shorts and sh short sleeves and shorts kind of a day. And um, there was like, hard to explain what happened, but there, were, there was a horse and buggy. Uh, there was a lot of people. There were some train tracks. There was an illegally parked car. And there was an inpatient GI fellow. And those things kind of conspired against me. And I ended up somehow going down these stairs that you see. It was like 
right over here in this area where the short ones are transitioning to the long ones. It's probably about a 10 foot drop and I landed on my head and uh, uh, sprained my neck and I is instantly paralyzed from the neck down. So I was laying there on the ground, just staring up at the sky, just saying, oh no, like quadriplegia. The word just popped into my mind and I had this like rush of emotions. Like it was, uh, I was saying, you know, I'm, I can't use my hands anymore. All this work I did or, you know, learning procedures and learning colonoscopy and I'm gonna be in a wheelchair and I'm gonna be abandoned and um, I'm gonna lose my family and my friends. And, I, you know, I just like catastrophized, of course, in that moment, even beyond what I should have been thinking about. Um, most of the patients that I had seen that were quadriplegic in the hospital didn't really have anybody with them. A lot of them had been, um, you know, just on their own in facilities and not well taken care of with chronic, you know, UTIs or wounds or, you know, it's just, you see the worst of it uh, when, as a physician. Um, so, Still, as a GI fellow, I did the right thing and I asked for somebody to call the page operator at UCSF and notify them that I was no longer on call and that could they please forward any GI consults to my attending um, Dr. Korn. So that was good. And then I called my wife and I told her to, um, you know, please meet me at the hospital. I'd had an accident. And so she went there and, um, you know, they, they put, they, they wheeled me into the ER at San Francisco General. I was surrounded by all these people that I knew who were understandably freaked out. And, um, you know, uh, I just was laying there on the gurney and watching them put these big IVs in my arm and I couldn't feel it. And then I heard some alarms go off over my head and I looked and like my pulse was going like 60, 50, 40, 30, and I was like, I don't know. I was, I, I thought it was very interesting. I was like, what's going on right now? It's a spinal shock. What's an AV block? What's going on with my heart right now? And, you know, and there's an anesthesiologist standing right over me with the, uh, the endotracheal tube and the, whatever those things are called, the metal thing they put in your mouth before. And he's just like ready. And then they give me a slug of dopamine and all of a sudden, like my pulse comes back up to like normal, and uh, I dodged a bullet on that one. I didn't need to be intubated, which was great. But you know, I spent the next uh, week or so in the ICU at San Francisco General, just unable to. I could move my left big toe, basically. That was it, and nobody could really tell me anything about. You know, of course, you want to know: Am I going to walk again? Am I going to be able to move? I, I've just laying there completely paralyzed was, I was just trying my best to muster all of my energy to just not panic and freak out because you feel like you're in like a cocoon. You know, it's not even like you don't feel anything from the neck down. It's like you feel this burning and pain and constriction. And um, so thankfully, you know, I started to regain a little bit of function. I, I, I was, uh, had a Krispy Kreme donut there my feeding tube is still down, but um, then I got transferred to Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, which was just a real um, like amazing privilege to have had such a um, prominent and well-run spinal cord injury unit so close to home. And you know, there gradually I started to recover some movement um, in my arms, um, my left arm, my left leg, the right side took a lot longer, but you know, they're teaching me how to brush my teeth again. And then I'm eating here some uh, delicious hospital French toast. And you can see I've got my like fork in a little attachment and then this thing on my arm. And then there's a big metal thing that's like going up and over my head uh, to hold my arm up. So all that for some French toast. And, um, you know, they had me in this motorized wheelchair. Um, I, had, I was driving it with uh, my chin. There was a joystick there and my hands are tied down um, to the wheelchair so they wouldn't fall off. And so, you know, I, I didn't, I was like, I don't wanna be in this, this wheelchair. Uh, you know, can't I, just was such a disconnect. Like, 
you know, at least let me do a hand joystick or something, but you know, I couldn't move my hand. So what are you going to do? And they were really great. They were like, you know, um, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. That's what they, that's what their motto was. And I thought that was really great. And they had a full team there dedicated to, um, you know, helping people get back not only um, their physical function, but also their mental health and to get back into life. And so, you know, immediately they, you, you see a, a psychologist the very first week you're there. And, you know, they have um, all sorts of different therapists, occupational, physical, recreational therapists, support groups, information about the Department of Rehabilitation and how disabled people can get back to work. Um, you know, I was so fortunate. I had doctors, Dr. Oda from the VA who runs the spinal cord injury unit there came and visited me when I was in the hospital. You know, so people saying that your life isn't over, you can still go back to doing what you love. It may look different, but um, so, you know, they put you on these like treadmills. It takes three people to even move my feet right there, but I'm trying hard. You can see on my face, just trying to get the body to move. Um, this is a fun game here called move the peg. So you can grab the peg from one hole and lift it up and then move it to the other hole. It's very fun to do over and over. And over. Like, you know, a few weeks before I'm doing a variceal banding and now I'm moving pegs. But, but Carol, my occupational therapist was so incredible and encouraging. And my physical therapist over here, Daryl, you know, never, he was on my side. He never, um, nobody ever told me you're never going to walk again. That wasn't part of the deal. Um, it was just, you know, let's make the most of what you have and see where it goes. And luckily, I was so fortunate to, you know, slowly recover the ability to move and to walk. It was such a relief. But, um, and like I said, they had recreational therapy. This is like an outing. I can't, I'm still driving that wheelchair with my chin, but they, took me and my wife out for a dinner and, um, you know, for our anniversary. And it was so, it was great to get out of the hospital for the first time, but it was also horrifying because you go into a restaurant full of people and like, you know, everyone turns around and looks at you and then your table's way in the back and literally like everybody has to get out of their chairs and move out of the ways you can go through in your wheelchair. And it just makes you really self-conscious, not to mention that these Bands like beep at 150 decibels whenever the lift goes up or down, just in case. They also did, like, uh, they had water therapy. Here I am with the towel on my head, swimming in the pool with three women. You know, <laughs> it's like not such a bad thing at rehab there. <laughs> Having fun, you know, so they try to like keep you busy. Um, the water is great. So um, well, I'm just going to transition here. I'll pick up my story a little bit later, but I figure since most of you um, most of you are interested in diversity in, in some way, and so this is preaching to the choir, and I'm not going to spend too much time on why diversity matters, but of course, you know that uh, it leads to better problem solving. Um, Scott Page, this researcher from Michigan, did a study that shows if you put a team of intelligent people together at random, they will outform, outperform a team that's composed of the highest performers, the best and brightest. So he says, like, diversity trumps ability. And research conducted by diverse teams is more cited, cited more often and is published in more prestigious journals. And let's not forget, on top of all that, that bias is pervasive. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it's 2020, but we still have a lot of prejudice and um, ignorance to overcome. So what about diversity in the hospital setting? Well, it's better for patients. You know, research shows that diversity in the physician workforce uh, impacts the quality of care received by patients. So that's from the AAMC diversity report. And physician-patient concordance, that is like if your doctor looks like you do, improves health outcomes, medication adherence, um, and they're more likely to just follow the doctor's directions if they can identify with them. And so that's also important. 
So let's transition to talking more about disability as a diversity. You know, this, uh, this was like a kind of a foreign idea to me. Uh, I didn't really think of it even as a diversity issue until maybe a couple years ago when, um, when our hospital, or sorry, when our department, the Department of Radiology formed our diversity committee and I saw a handout that showed, you know, people in wheelchairs and, and crutches and, and I should have put that picture in here, but I said, I looked at the names of the people on the committee and I realized that nobody was actually representing disability. And, um, you know, there's a, a phrase in the disability community, you know, nothing about us without us. And so I felt it was, you know, my obligation to get involved. And, you know, if you look around at a lot of diversity efforts, it looks like this, you know, it's a, it's a lot of um, gender and ethnicity, which I care about a great deal. I feel like it's really important. And that's why I'm a member of diversity committees to support underrepresented minorities and women. But, you know, it's just not, it's just not a part of a lot of efforts. I mean, even, and this got pointed out to me, I went to a talk a, a woman um, gave uh, on um, universal design for learning a few months ago. And she actually put up this message from our website. So the UW, the UW um, woman came to shame us a little bit and put this quote up, a university depends upon the participation and inclusion of all backgrounds, races, genders, identities, ideologies, and ways of thinking. I mean, that's a long list of diversity, but of course, you know, you see what's, what's missing. And, um, and then there's this whole other thing, you know, ableism. I didn't know what ableism was even until oh, a year ago. I had never heard the word. This is basically overt or, or even um, unconscious discrimination against people with disabilities, thinking that people with disabilities are inferior or somehow have character flaws, you know, and so when somebody, uh, you know, when I'm out in public with my wife and somebody goes up to her and says, you're such an angel for what you do, you know, like, like I'm, a, she's, she's an angel for being with me. That's an ableist comment. Or when you go out in public and somebody talks to, you know, your caregiver or employee rather than talking to you, that's an example of ableism, or when somebody tries to pick up your wife and flirt with them right in front of you because you don't count, that's ableism. And so, you know, the last thing I'll say is when diversity doesn't include disability, that's also ableism. And our culture, you know, uh, is very ableist. Just, it's been that way for a long time. You know, these phrases that we say, stand on your own two feet and speak up for yourselves. You know, Kim Nielsen points these out as ableist phrases, and it's built into like the DNA of our country. And then, you know, if you want to take it to like an extreme, um, not to be over dramatic, but do you guys know what these films all have in common? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, these are all about assisted suicide. You know, the, the murder and killing of disabled people in Hollywood films. And it's not an uncommon theme. It's like presented as sort of a logical conclusion to a, this, a disabled life, which isn't, and you know, people with disabilities are seen as a burden. I even feel like a burden uh, sometimes still, but I don't wanna kill myself. And in fact, I have a lot of fear of being admitted to the hospital and people deciding that, you know, if I'm altered and septic, like I was a couple of years ago, that you know, they may see my paralyzed body and my altered mental status and decide that maybe they're not gonna be that aggressive. You know, I, I have a fear of that. For anybody who's a hospitalist, I'm full code, just so you know. <laughs> We're like, settle that right now. Okay. So then there's this other thing, you know, in medicine, strength, right? We're expected, you know, Argavon gave a great interview with Lisa Meeks not, time, not too long ago when she talks about this and she says, you know, put our heads down, plow forward, don't complain, don't ask for anything, show up as a perfect worker, see lots of patients, have no thoughts or emotions or feelings, right? That's what we're expected for, to go without sleep or food for extended periods of time. 
And if you can't do it, you're out. You know, people aren't given time to take care of themselves. And, you know, it's not like we're um, embarrassed of this. We're actually proud of it. We wear it like a badge of honor in healthcare. Oh, how are you doing? You know, oh, I'm so busy. I only slept five hours last night. I've had 500 emails in my inbox and I've only had one day off in the last three weeks. And, you know, it's like, I'm like, because I'm super important and super busy, you know? So there is, but we need to talk more in medicine about being human, you know? We need, and especially I think with people with disabilities who spend so much of our time taking care of ourselves, um, you know, somebody with a reading disability could take twice as long to just read a journal article. You know, Lisa also pointed that out in your interview. And so, you know, this superhero physician idea who runs into the room to save the day is pretty um, counterproductive, I think. And uh, Lisa Mehta in one of these interviews made a great point. She says, the real superhero is a physician who can connect with the patient, have empathy and use creativity to help solve the problem. And that's what a real superhero is. And just in case anybody out there is thinking, well, how does this affect me? I mean, there is a huge overlap and, you know, as we say, intersectionality between ableism, sexism, and racism. And um, again, there's this, there's this great book here called The Disability History of the United States. And um, she says, you know, when disability is considered to be synonymous with deficiency uh, and dependency, it contrasts sharply with American ideals of independence. And disability has served in a, as an effective weapon in contests over power and ideology. For example, she says, at varying times, African-Americans, immigrants, gays, lesbians, poor people, and women have been defined categorically as defective citizens, incapable of full civic participation. If you look at the roots of sexism and racism, it's like a belief that somehow those people are inferior to others. And so, there's, I think that this affects everyone. And if you're still not convinced because you don't have a disability, you should rethink that because, and rephrase it too, you don't have a disability yet because I hope that all of you one day get old enough to develop a disability and somebody takes good care of you when you're 100 years old, but stay healthy until then, please. Um, I need someone to take care of me. So, but you know, there's like, you know, even in the course of, um, even if you don't consider yourself disabled, you can be touched by disability. And, you know, things like having a child, uh, parental or medical leave, injuries or temporary illness. One of our guys was on crutches, you know, for and a wheelchair for a few months after an accident. Uh, burnout, uh, mental illness, you know, depression, anxiety. People in their late career often, you know, are less abled. And uh, nobody knows the future. And I think it's just important in general that we have and promote a culture of um, asking for help. If you need something, absence, flexibility, whatever, I think we need to be promoting that culture. I should also add that, you know, disability, in my mind, is diverse. We're not just talking about someone like me with mobility. People with learning disabilities, chronic health conditions, ADA. And there's a lot of diversity. And, um, you know, this organization that I founded, SMAC, is open to everybody, and no matter what their, their disability is. And I think you actually um, some of the hardest disabilities for people to deal with are the ones that are invisible, because sometimes, you know, people don't even believe that there's anything wrong with you. And, um, you know, it's interesting, too, she, Kim Nielsen makes this other point in that book, that she says disability can include disease or illness, but it often does not. Non-disabled people can be ill. Illness sometimes leads to disability. When it does, the illness can go away, but the disability remains. So illness and disease and disability in themselves are not all synonymous. So, you know, I'm in good company here. People with disabilities are the largest minority in America, one out of five, according to recent statistics, but not represented very well in healthcare. Um, it's getting better. If you look at medical students, it was like less than 1% in the late um, 90s. 
and then uh, 2.7 percent they measured in 2016 and then the last study showed about five percent and i think you know maybe it's due in some part to um more reporting but it's still likely underreported just because there's such a barrier i think to students and residents because of their power differential actually declaring or asking uh you know claiming a disability and asking for reasonable accommodations, which I think is difficult. And the most of these disabilities are actually like ADHD, psychological and learning disabilities. And then next comes chronic health conditions. And then after that, you know, disabilities like mine or sensory conditions are the least common. So the most common disabilities are the ones that are invisible. And again, that's tough because sometimes people don't actually believe you. So I'm gonna to return to that beginning, uh, what I said in the beginning when I asked you to close your eyes and picture a physician and um, just try to bring that back into your mind. Um, maybe you thought of me because I'm right in front of you. <laughs> that, uh, but you know, somebody in a white coat in a wheelchair this is, um, this is Alexandra Adams. She's deaf and blind, a medical student in the UK. This is um, Fernan, Fernami Okalani. He's a doctor at Michigan Medicine. He was paralyzed in 2013 during his medical residency. Here he's looking in a microscope in a stand-up wheelchair. Um, this guy here um, is... Uh, doing surgery in a stand-up wheelchair. Uh, he's paralyzed from the waist down. Um, this woman here uh, has, a, has a disorder that causes her to have uh, decreased strength. Now she, it's very interesting, she was in a uh, an ob residency. She went into it despite the fact that she had this disability and um, was really disappointed that she wasn't able to complete it. Um, I don't, she, I don't think she was treated very fairly. She was judged, and this often happens with um, people with disabilities. They're judged on a different standard than other people. And she would tie knots a little differently because her hand muscles or the ones that were strong were different from other people. And she was able to tie the knots well, but they would really get on her case about it because um, you know, she wasn't doing it the right way, the way that they wanted her to. And um, so she was really forced into a box. She decided to leave and do internal medicine and she's gonna do maternal fetal medicine uh, fellowship through internal medicine. So you guess there's another pathway, but um, she's lucky that she found a place that welcomed her instead of judging her. And then maybe some of you know this guy, this is uh, my friend and colleague Payam who, um, you know, is chief of the radiology at the VA and also the program director of the radiology residency. So I don't know who you guys pictured in your mind, if you pictured a, a white guy or a black woman or a disabled person or whatever, but I think for a lot of people like this isn't what people have in mind when you think of a doctor. So, you know, what's so great about physicians and scientists with disabilities? Um, you know, and this has been a, gra a gradual transition for me and mindset of thinking about disabilities as something to deal with or a problem to solve rather than something to search for and seek out and try to incorporate because of the strength of um, their perspective on life and health that's different from other people just by virtue of what they've been through. And you have to have grit to make it to this point, to have, to become a physician. If you've gotten to this point, you know, there's a good chance that you're gonna continue to succeed. Um, there's a feel good component to having people with disabilities around. It's not like an inspiration thing. It's like when you see your institution or your company doing the right thing and accommodating people with disabilities, it makes you more proud to work there because you feel like you're, they're a, um, a moral or a just organization. We generate more monetary benefits and costs. Um, you know, students learn as much from each other as they do from their classes. This is also listened to in one of Dr. Meeks's uh, web, uh, one of her um, podcasts. 
you know. And so uh, there's like a lot that we can teach our fellow classmates or our colleagues. We understand better what our patients face, um, you know, and uh, in one of these interviews, uh, Lisa Meda again said another great coach, she says, what's black and white to one physician is fully nuanced to another. We're here to heal, take care, and look at our patients with as broad of a lens as possible to help solve their problems. That's what we're supposed to do as healthcare professionals. And solving problems takes creativity and imagination. And having been on both sides of the fence, I think helps. I'm not saying I'm a better doctor than anybody else. I'm just saying that I might have a different perspective having been on the other side, having had, you know, stays in the ICU, uh, sepsis, altered mental status, ICU psychosis, um, you know, wound infections and the like. I've seen a lot of great things about uh, medicine and I've seen a lot of bad things that are frankly embarrassing. And that's like a topic for a whole other talk. So um, here I am in the hospital doing a crab walk in my wheelchair. They're just trying to get my legs moving Eventually, I was able to stand up with these full leg braces, get in the parallel bars, and try to start walking on my own, which was wonderful. And then after about six months or so, I was able to get around with this crutch. And it's kind of been like that ever since. Uh, that's kind of where it stopped getting better. I met a lot of great people in the hospital, you know, um, people who had had bad, really bad things happen to them. Um, there was this, it was kind of weird because I was the only one out of all my friends in the hospital who actually regained the ability to walk again. The other ones were, you know, didn't really improve. And there was like, I think a sense of jealousy, but, but happiness, they were happy for me and I was sad for them. But, um, you know, it was, it was good. We had each other and we certainly had a lot of jokes and good times even in the hospital. So then I go home, I had to remodel my entire apartment, put in hardwood floors so the wheelchair could roll around in it. And my 500 square foot apartment in San Francisco. Um, I had to hire a caregiver, this is my second caregiver. Um, you know, adapt my bathroom with these shower chairs and um, loofah sticks. So being disabled costs a lot of money. I threw in the, the, the wad of cash for that. Um, I made my uh, salary my first year. Uh, my injury was like $40,000 and my medical costs were $44,000. We actually had to send out a letter to our friends and family asking for donations. And luckily we got a lot that was able to get me extra therapy and extra care, which I think did make a difference in how far I was able to progress. But, um, you know, I just, I should take this moment to acknowledge that like I come from a real place of privilege and that I don't want to imply in any way that like my story is typical of everybody's story or that, you know, if you just work hard and go for it, you know, you're gonna make it. I don't think that's the case at all. I think that I, a come up from a place of privilege. I had family support. I had my wife. I had a supportive uh, GI department. Um, I had um, money and I was already through like medical school and one residency. So it was a lot different for me than for a lot of other people. But um, I also learned how to manage some medications, which was kind of a nightmare also and gave me a respect for that. So I want to just, this is the doctor I was talking about, the one who switched from ob guy to internal medicine. And she talks about her um, experience with, as a doctor and as a, and a, as a patient. And, um, you know, she said that uh, a lot of her attendings wouldn't feel comfortable letting her do things in the OR. She said also that, like, when you walk into a room of co-residents, attendings, other physician, she feels like everyone is staring at her and she's very different. But she says, I have not once walked into a patient room and felt that at all. I don't ever feel the sense of shock from a patient. Sometimes there's a like, she says, 
a little interaction, like, I don't mean to pry, but would you mind telling me what happened? But she doesn't feel judgment. And in fact, she feels that patients, like she says in this quote, react to her and seem to bond to her in a way that they didn't with a lot of her classmates and attendings. And I found that same, that same interaction when I went back to see patients. There's um, Molly Lubin, who's a deaf physician, and she also talks about um, vulnerability and how she uses vulnerability to teach her trainees um, you know, how to um, help patients with fear and isolation and develop more caring, empathic physicians. This is a diagram that just shows, and it's kind of complicated from, well, it's not that complicated. It's basically showing that if you interact with a student or professional with a disability, your disability awareness will increase. You have fewer assumptions and less stereotyping, and then more uh, informed patient care. And then since you have less stereotypes about people with disabilities, you're more likely to provide better care and better care will translate into reduced, reduced, reduced uh, healthcare disparities. But you know, we're at Stanford, right? So, and everything's good. Here I am talking to you, of course. I invited, I invited myself onto this stage a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a problem, just like a little yes, all caps. <laughs> You know, I've been stuck in the toilet here down the hall. Uh, some of the physical staff is like, physical plant is not really accessible. Um, but there are other bad things that happen. Now that I'm doing this work, people come to me and share stories about even like harassment and hazing, um, ableist attitudes in the admissions committee, sometimes just not even realizing it. People not believing people with, indiv with invisible disabilities. You know, when you have a letter that says you're only allowed to work eight hours a day because of your, you know, this is decided with a doctor and a professional, but then, you know, you're in clinic and they're like, oh, you're gonna leave already? We have such an interesting case in room five, you know? And it's like, and then, okay, well, see you later. I hope you enjoy your evening. We'll be here until seven seeing patients. And just like attitudes like that, and this happens. So, you know, and then of course, you don't have to believe me, you can look at the news. This wasn't in the medical center, but this was on the main campus where, um, you know, they weren't really doing the right thing around students on leaves of absence um, after like suicidal ideation. And um, well, it's a complex case, but Stanford um, had to settle it for a lot of money. So what are the challenges to incorporating with people with disabilities? All right, there's a lot of misconceptions, first of all. Safety, burden, time consuming, expensive, compensation, liability, think of all of these things, but they're not true. Um, most accommodations cost less than $1,000. Um, liability risks are really overblown. And uh, you know, one thing that is not in here is like fairness, you know? Well, why does, like I said, why does she get to work eight hours a day and I have to work 12? Or, you know, it's not, why do they get an extra half hour on their test? That's not fair. Not realizing that they, that person really does have a learning disability. So, you know, there's a lack of info. How do you move forward to be more inclusive? Poor messaging here also at Stanford, untrained admissions committee and interviewers, people who want to do the right thing, but don't know how. Um, overstaffed, oh, overstaffed, no, not overstaffed, understaffed and um, under-informed disability services. There's poor information. People don't know how to access accommodations. The process for requesting them is sometimes hard. There's a lack of mentorship. Um, people with disabilities mentoring younger people and then rigid policies just not anchored to learning realities. So, I'm running out of time here and uh, the talk is called Creative Inclusion. So I'm just gonna talk a bit about my switch to radiology. I interviewed at some places who just said, I don't see how you can do this. You gotta hang the films and, and go from here to there and the scanner and it's just not gonna work. You should really rethink this. And Stanford, to their credit, was like, wow, you have all this internal medicine and GI experience and you've 
like overcome so much and we can make it work, just figure it out, you know, and we just figured it out. And the, the Department of Rehab got me a van um, that I could drive myself and eventually I got this Segway and all this made my life easier. And my program director, Terry and I, we would just sit down and she would say, what do you need? And I would tell her and we would like try to brainstorm. Okay, what are we gonna do when you're on interventional radiology? You're not gonna be like putting catheters into people. And then we're like, okay, well, what are the different roles? She said, well, there is this consult phone, right? And nobody wants to hold the consult phone because they're taking all the phone calls. But that person could literally just sit down at a computer and look at films and take phone calls. And that would be like a huge win for everybody because nobody else wants it. And I loved it. And, you know, it was great. <laughs> Things like that, you know, uh, just ways to work around problems together. And that's the way it, it should be. Uh, you know, thankfully, I have volunteers at the hospital who also help me. I have 10 volunteers, one per half day. These are my residency classmates. They were incredibly important in getting me through my residency um, at all steps of the way. This is just a graph of the interactive process. This is basically what I was talking about with Terry Desser, you know, like identify barriers, identify possibilities, assess the effectiveness, evaluate for impact on the program. You know, does it change the essential functions of the job? And then we're round and round. It's a fancy diagram just showing that what two people can do when they are open-minded and creative about solving problems. There is this recent article, not to just talk about myself the whole time there. We wrote, a, uh, Lisa Meeks and I, who's um, been an incredible mentor the last few months. She and I wrote a commentary about this uh, novel medical student assistant accommodation model for so there was this uh, medical student with a cervical spinal cord injury, and he was at University of Washington, and he had a required ED elective, or not, a required rotation in the emergency department. And, you know, he can't really examine people, and he can't write, and he's in a wheelchair. So what they did was they hired four second-year medical students as intermediaries. And the fourth year would ask all the history questions. He would tell the intermediary how to do the physical exam, what maneuvers, to perform, and then the intermediary would tell him the findings on exam. Then he'd write all his notes with uh, Dragon, naturally speaking, um, voice recognition. And it was, uh, you know, pretty successful. He got an honors, which only 25% were given. It was a win-win, again, because the uh, MS4 got the help he needed giving the, doing the exams and the intermediaries were able, they were, like I said, second year medical students, they were able to get in there in the clinic and um, make $17 an hour, of course, but also, you know, get, uh, get experience in the ER. And then he continued to use this sort of model during his internship when he left there. So, um, you know, this is just another example of how people being creative and solving problems together can have good outcomes. And it was minimal funding, minor admin support, eight hours of additional faculty time. So Lisa and I wrote this commentary um, describing how medicine is becoming more inclusive, that it's relatively easy with teamwork and creativity to include people. And I already talked about the win-win, but the unintended consequence is reducing stereotypes through these sort of shared experiences and that upward spiral diagram that I showed you that, you know, by rubbing elbows with each other and working on the same level and having a peer with the disability, um, it really diminishes the stereotype. So I started the Stanford Medicine Abilities Coalition about a year ago, and um, we're here to advocate for the rights of people with disabilities. And we have uh, two main goals. The one is to actually go out and recruit students, trainees, and faculty with disabilities to bring them here and support them when they get here. And then one other thing is we wanna create a fully staffed, nationally recognized central office of disability services that covers all of Stanford medicine. So the hospital, um, the medical school, the graduate school, um, all residents, fellows, nurses, RTs, OTs, whatever we wanna, have a disability office, which doesn't exist right now. It's very 
um, decentralized and each accommodation is made at the departmental level. And so like, you know, I can go to my DFA and say I need some equipment and they're great, you know, and they will provide it, but uh, she's not an expert in disability accommodations. And there's so few people with disabilities and things are so decentralized. If you're a pathologist and you ask for accommodation, that might be the first and last time that person ever has to deal with this kind of a request. But if you have a central office of people who are experienced and doing it for everyone, then they have, I think, a much better shot at um, accommodating people and supporting them in a way that ensures their success. So you're probably sitting there all fired up and excited right now. <laughs> so I can tell you how to help if you want. Um, you know, go to your websites and take a look and see what it says about disability inclusion. Talk to your community about these issues. You know, recruit people with disabilities. Showcase your providers with disabilities. Thanks Department of Medicine for showcasing me today. This is all allyship. Um, you know, make info about accommodations easy to find. If we offer accommodations to everyone, it sort of normalizes it. And if it's right on your application or on your website and easy to find, there's less stigma. But once those people get here, support them in leadership and career development. And, you know, those of you who have disabilities, um, reaching out to younger people and trying to help them. And the big thing is, you know, disclose, disclose, disclose. Until people start talking about what's really going on in their lives, there will continue to exist a stigma around mental illness, around disability, and it's really harmful. But the more we can disclose and talk about it openly, the more people will feel um, empowered to do the same. And you know, Sarah says, if you don't ask, you're not hurting anybody else. You're just lessening the potential that you have to become better. And um, you know, that's true. Nobody loses out but you if you don't ask for help. Not to mention the NIH and other uh, governing bodies actually mandate that we are required to uh, demonstrate successful efforts to recruit students with disabilities. So it's uh, you know not really an option, which is good. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's like a brochure right here that gives you a roadmap on exactly what to do. Lisa Meeks wrote it. If you're in basic science, the NIH has a diversity toolkit that also has um, great suggestions for helping people with disabilities. Lastly, I'm just going to talk about messaging. Our messaging is bad at Stanford in a nutshell. UCSF says, we have a proud history of training physicians with disabilities and provide reasonable accommodations for all qualified individuals who apply for our program and right, enrolled as medical students. Now that's a great statement, right? A proud history. That's, that's on their uh, technical standards page. Stanford says, um, we are not intending to deter any candidate for whom reasonable accommodation will allow the fulfillment, but you must have the physical and emotional stamina and capacity to function in a competent manner in the hospital, classroom, laboratory settings, including settings that will involve heavy workloads, long hours, and stressful situations. This is your internal medicine uh, residency website here uh, talking, this is the diversity part of it. It talks about, um, feel strongly that diversity of ethnic, religious and gender identity is critical to creating an environment of collaborative things. But you know, there's something missing from, you may want to go to your webmaster. The okay, <laughs> there, all right, cool. Wow, that was efficient. I don't have to even email anybody. Um, this is actually your Department of Medicine web page um, is, does better. They have a really good diversity and inclusion um, statement. And it talks about uh, race, ethnicity, language, nationality, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, geography, disability, and age. So that's really good. It's right there. This is, I mean, really it matters what we're showing to the outside world. You think it's just a web page, but people are out there and looking to see what our messaging is. 
And it's like the lowest hanging fruit to just like add a line in there about valuing diversity and including disability. It's super easy. How about this one? Stanford University is an affirmative action equal opportunity employer. It's like really not welcoming. It's like the, the bare minimum of the law. Affirmative action equal opportunity. And you know, we hate being compared to unfavorably to our nemesis on the East Coast. But you know, if you go to a lot of their web pages, they have stuff, you know, right there talking about diversity, women in STEM. They've got a tweet here in Spanish, you know, that's, well, I don't know if they're any better than we are with diversity, but it, if you look at their web page, you would think that they were. So last thing I'm gonna do is just plug uh, our ability survey that'll be coming out soon. Um, it's gonna be longer than you want it to be, but please fill it out. We need to know what, how many people at Stanford have disabilities and what their experience is and how their experience compares to able-bodied people. Um, I sent an email to the president of the university, of course, <clears throat> and now he includes races, genders, abilities, identities in his sentence, so they changed it. They didn't email me to tell me they changed it, but they did anyways when I checked. So um, here's our social media information. We have a web page if you want to join us or like us or follow us. And last of all, I just want to say thank you. Um, SMAC came out of the Faculty Senate Subcommittee on Diversity with Iris Gibbs and Phil Harder being really supportive. Bonnie and Mogali and Dean Miner, you know, the OFDD. The medical students with disability and chronic illness and the University Stanford Disability Initiative were so awesome. When I, when I started SMAC, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing at all. Tell me about disability. And they came with like a 20 page manifesto with, you know, 50 references at the end. It was, it was awesome. Uh, of course, Mary Stutz and the uh, IDAG office, the Department of Radiology has been very supportive. My chairman, Sam Gambier and Heike, Aldrip Link, who chairs our diversity committee, and then all the members of SMAC and our board of directors, and my friend Lisa Meeks also, who's taught me a lot. So um, with that, I will end and thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Dr. Poulos. Um, I think we have time for a question or two, if anyone from the audience would like to ask. Bye, Jean-Louis. Yeah. I have a quick question. Would you elaborate a little bit more on people asking about your abilities? Yeah, people, well, you know, patients and strangers. Uh, patients, you mean? Or stra or strangers or oh, strangers, anything. Yeah, yes. no. So the Elaborate. segue is definitely a conversation yep. starter, no yeah, matter where you go. Everybody has a comment about it. Um, people strike up conversations. Some people are really cool, and they're like, oh, that's a great idea, you know. Or my, my brother doesn't get around so well anymore. I'm going to tell him about the segue. Probably the worst is when people come up to me and ask if they can lay hands on me and pray for me. Um, that's a little annoying. But I actually did let them do it once. It was kind of <laughs> somewhere in Texas, I think it was. But no, I mean, it's all about the attitude and the respect, right? Yeah, and you can tell when a person is coming to you with genuine curiosity and empathy. And I don't mind that. Um, what I don't like is when people just make flippant off the cuff comments without thinking and just, um, you know, yeah, a lot of, it's funny because like I can put a handicap sticker on that thing and have my crutches on it. And some people just, they'll never get it. They just don't see it. They just think I'm like a rich Silicon Valley guy tooling around on his Segway, you know, what are you going to do? Question over there. Yeah, I can hear you. Wait, 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 but every, not everybody can hear. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm interested um, to know if the committee has done any work around multiple chemical sensitivities and fragrance-free issues? No, not at all. But that would be something great to work on if you want to 
reach out to me about that. I got in an argument with my caregiver last night about that. She was wearing too much uh, body lotion with vanilla flavoring, and it was really annoying me. <laughs> she, she got very upset, but you know, I have an aversion to strong scents. So thank you for that. Oh, here's that. Um, one of the one of the things that was difficult when we were moving from um, 300p to 500 pasture was um, the f accommodations that were not documented. It is so important to document um, accommodations. Um, it's there is no penalty in asking for accommodations. You'd be surprised how many people want to do the right thing, and yes. mostly accommodations um, really are very inexpensive, um, but it's important to document this in case there are moves like this um, so that we don't have to start from scratch. So thank you for um, raising awareness about um, disabilities, especially those that you can't see. Yeah, you know, and I think that like, I met with Sam Shen and Helen Wilmot yesterday about some accessibility and safety issues around the back of the hospital and they were extremely uh, open and welcoming. They've been very responsive. Um, I think that they were kind of in a rush to open the hospital mm -hmm. and wasn't quite finished. Um, you know, there's like no accessible restroom, for example, on in the radiology department. Mm -hmm. The doors weigh like 500 pounds. Mm -hmm. And so, but they're gonna put in a, a motorized door like soon. So they've been open to I, I agree with you. I think most people really want to do the right thing. It's just that if you don't have a disability and you're walking around, you just don't notice. You know, somebody will come back from uh, a trip to Tokyo and I'll say, well, how accessible was it? Were there curb cuts? Or I was like, I don't remember. You just don't see what doesn't affect you, I think. We've got, I know we're running out of time, but we do have one more question from Zoom. Someone says, thank you. Um, this is from Lori. Thank you for a great talk. I am an adjunct lecturer in psychiatry, si child psychiatry, in fact. I work with students on the spectrum and have a very difficult time helping them get services. I also feel that autism is not seen as a disability for today's students, medical students, fellows, and staff. Where do you suggest becoming involved? This is from Dr. Leventhal Belfer. Yeah, so actually Lawrence Fung is, uh, has an amazing um, neurodiversity project at Stanford. Um, and they are doing a ton of outreach, helping people with, on the spectrum find jobs um, and uh, you know, become more independent. He really, the, their approach is that, you know, it's not um, that neurodiversity is a strength and that these people have a lot to add from their different cognitive skill set. And so I would say getting involved with Lawrence Fung would be your best bet in making headway. Just so you know, we did include it down here. So yeah, a lot of work on neurodiversity through the Department of Adult Psychiatry. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm so sorry. Can we just give Dr. Peter Poulos one more round of applause for that very informative and Wonderful talk. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, everybody. And thank you for sharing your story with us. Thanks. I know someone has another question. Right? Cool.
There wasn't anything included. Like I said, I think people are trying to people are trying to bad about it. It's just too much. No, if people want us to take the rest of his lunch with him. Yeah, I'll go to Oh. And help yourself too. Oh, you got plenty of back there. Um, I don't think I'll be able to carry everything. That's a balancing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So we're actually just doing our piece. Take any further questions if we could go outside yes. and thank you, so much. thank you, Peter. You guys start. I'm sorry, I'll be out of here. That's okay. Seconds. I have your. What's this? This one's about resilience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay. All right. Thank you so much for coming to um, this last session of our very busy day today. Um, and uh, I just wanted to preview that uh, I will introduce Tia in a minute, but also our last event tomorrow of the week is also Tia uh, leading um, a, a session that actually is going to be held at the, is it Windover? Windover um, Center on campus, just the other side of Robley Field, meeting at noon till one on meditation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me introduce Dr. Tia Rich for this session. Um, and our next session is called Practical Resilience Skills for Sustaining Progress Toward Greater Inclusion and Diversity. Dr. Rich is the founder and director of Contemplation by Design, a multidisciplinary campus-wide collaboration that enhances resiliency by encouraging all members of the Stanford community to enjoy the power of the pause for purposes of reestablishing balance, tranquility, compassion, and energy. Uh, 
And this allows us to support our engagement in all the activities that we do around teaching, discovery, and caring for patients um, and supporting those who do. I did go a couple years ago to Tia's day-long Power of the Pause, which was part of Be Well. And I have to tell you, it was one of the best days of my life. It was really, really great. Got me out of my comfort zone, and uh, but in a way that made me feel very refreshed and able to cope with uh, all the things that go on in my life. And I think um, I, if you have a chance to do that again, or if Tia offers that again, I'd really encourage you to try it. Um, Dr. Rich also conducts research on well-being, teaches academic classes and professional development workshops, and has authored Breathing for Longevity, Love, and Livelihood. She has been integrating contemplative practice into resiliency and stress management programs at Stanford and in the hospitals since 1984. So I think you will find this to be very interesting and calming session, which I think we all need. We've talked about a lot of very challenging and difficult topics today. And um, I think this will give us a moment to think about ways that we can process all that we are learning and help us do a better job to be allies and to create the inclusive environment we want at Stanford Medicine. So Tia, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy, for the introduction and for your wonderful organization and leadership of this day and this week of activities. The event that Kathy participated in, the Power of the Pause day-long retreat, is offered every quarter if you're interested. As Kathy referenced, we've touched deep topics with a lot of emotions, a lot of good factual information and inspiring uh, witnessing to progress that's been made, but we all know that there's much work still to be done. In this hour together, my goal is to do what Kathy said, to help us to really be equipped to go forward, to actually apply what we were inspired to make a difference around during the earlier sessions. In this session, we will be doing some practical activities as well as gaining some awareness of what's known in the field of applying resilience to the goals of inclusion and diversity. So I begin by asking you, who is your role model regarding this goal of being more diverse, more inclusive, fostering more belonging, more equity? Just think of that person. What, by the end of our hour together, I'm, my goal is to leave you with a set of tools. Some of them will be tangible tools. You will actually leave with a shell. Uh, you see this tray of shells, which you'll learn why as we go forward. But some of the tools will be just prompts like this, a mental image. Who inspires you? How are you creating greater diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity for yourself and others? What is the perspiration that you are actually generating through your efforts? And then why are you here? Why did you take the time to come and be part of this hour when there's so many things that I know you could be doing? What skills, what knowledge, what purpose, what is your commitment that you seek to strengthen in all learning, we have this model of motivation where we're comfortably curious why you signed up to be here. But we also know that there are other members of this grid and that that comfortable area is what we know we don't know. But the one that I hope you will be in for at least part of this hour is the yellow grid where you feel vulnerable, where it's an opportunity to have an aha, that you realize there's something you didn't even know you didn't know. So we'll begin with a few definitions of terms. What is this concept of diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity? And we're gonna use a nautical uh, metaphor because we're really traveling through uncharted territories and sometimes using imagery can help us when we're feeling overwhelmed with our endeavors. The wise compass is going to be our guide. The compassion, the de desire to be wise and compassionate will be our rudder and that we will have lifestyle skills that are our sails as well as our rigging. And then our moral courage, which is an important concept, will be the wind that is the fuel for our action. After listening to a lot of words and slides and data, I invite you to take in another medium, and that is the medium of sound. And just listen to 
what happens when we think about that we aspire towards these goals. We take in inspiration from speakers like those today. We exert their perspiration. We need to put it all into action, and that is our compassion made manifest. And now listen to this music and just see what it does for how you feel. Oops. It's not playing, and our IT man has left the room. I am sorry about that. We checked our um, audio earlier, and it worked. If anybody could see if the IT person could come back since we did do a dry run and the music did play, I'm going to. Well, I'm not sure I know how to get back. Uh, I followed your lead. Thank you for the effort. Let's see if I can. I apologize. Let's see if. Well, we'll just skip the music and go forward. Uh, if he can come back in, there are other places where the music would be helpful. So diversity, as we've heard throughout the day, is a fact of the world that we live in. Inclusion, though, is the practice that we're aspiring to. We're setting this as our intention for our culture in the Department of Medicine to make it a cultural norm. The process is to actually foster the sense of belonging. And this is where it gets more nuanced, more complex, and requires some interpersonal skills. Our gentleman is back, and since, do you know how to get the music? There it is. Okay, now listen to the music. <laughs> Thank you. Somos el barco. Somos el mar. Yo navego en ti. Tu navegas en mí. We are the boat. We are the sea. I sail in you. You sail in me. I hope that that helps you to have another tool. Words, musical lyrics, mentors are all part of our toolkit. That piece of music is one that I do play in my toolkit when I'm feeling separate, that I don't belong, that I want to feel a greater inclusion and connection. And I hear that beautiful lyric and that beautiful voice of Pete Seeger. And it's a reminder of this interconnected world that we do live in and that we can highlight and nourish. So as I was saying, our goal for the department is to create this cultural norm of inclusion and belonging. And belonging is where it becomes more complicated, where we notice how we speak to people, how we look at people, how we actually help people retain their identity and embrace their identity, rather than make them feel they have to be a chameleon and join into what they think is wanted of them. The goal of equity, of course, is the crown jewel of this whole process and being able to feel that you're received for who you are and that you are offered what is offered to others, whether that's equal pay, authorship, pronoun accuracy, access to a room. Let's use another metaphor, leaving the nautical world and let's come to the dancing world. Diversity is being invited to the dance. Inclusivity is being asked to dance. Belonging is being able to dance however I like to dance. But equity is being able to choose the music and choose the DJ. So live your dance. What is your dance? Music again to help you feel into your identity. for the next meeting you're in where you don't feel heard. 
and you just feel your rhythm. You feel what's inside you and what you're trying to say, and you stay true to it and feel the tempo of your own thoughts and your values. And if the tempo that's surrounding you is different, find your moment to step into that dance and bring the quality of your dance into the conversation. Usually in diversity and inclusion workshops, we have this exercise of identifying descriptors for our social identity categories. It's very dry and often not very animated, but hopefully in this language of dance and music and tempo, you can begin to identify your dance more clearly and more authentically. So we'll do a little activity, pick three of these categories and name a description that represents you. Mine might be that my citizenship is that I'm in the United States and that my parental status, I'm a godparent to five children. Choose three, just take a moment. What three categories speak to you? What is your answer, your description? This is just another way to see yourself. When we're deeply seeing ourselves with compassion and authenticity, we can stay true to that dance when we're in difficult conversations where it's easy to get lost or to be overwhelmed or just to be discouraged. Am I at the dance? Am I dancing? Is the dance a co-created community? Is there congruence between what the values written on websites are and what is actually practiced? And is the community life affirming and creating relationships through collaboration? In psychology there and in the neuroscience uh, field, there have been three different areas of emotional regulation recognized and they're just portrayed very simply here that we have the threat system, which we hear a lot about in terms of fight or flight and elevated cortisol and stress related illnesses and the basic threat to survival. Will I be able to pay my mortgage, my rent? Will I be able to live in the area where my family raised me as the prices go up? On and on around these basic safety and survival questions. The drive system, will I feel able to contribute and be a member of the generative community? Will I be able to pursue my dreams and have enough energy from my dopamine to actually achieve my goals? And then the third, the soothing system. Will I have the ability to feel calmed and soothed and seen in a way that helps my body to stay healthy through adequate levels of oxytocin and naturally occurring opiates to ease the pain of prejudice and discrimination and other aspects of non-inclusion and non-diverse recognition and respect. Now, what do we do with these three areas of regulation? We actually can develop skills. And this is where in the contemplative practices for thousands of years, there's some core skills that I've just summarized here with the pause, exhale, attend, connect, express acronym, which means peace or stands for peace or the peace process. As we unpack this further, we'll see that each of these words represents specific contemplative practices, the mindful movement of yoga or qigong or tai chi, or just simply stretching your back and rolling your neck and shoulders. A body scan is part of pausing, exhaling to de deeply let go of what's no longer necessary by exhaling, and then you can inhale completely, befriending the breath. When I first learned about breathing from a Harvard doctor who had studied breathing practices in India, he had an activity where he said, what's the most important thing to you in your life? People came up with all kinds of examples like my family, my home, my career, my health. And then he said, all right, close both your nostrils. And then everybody started laughing and said, oh, okay, my breath is my most important thing. So we often forget our breath and becoming more of a friend to our breath and the power it plays in our well being is a part of this peace process. Loving kindness is another activity that can help cultivate our well being and our resilience. And I'm not going to read the whole list. I've just summarized the last categories that the attending is what the whole realm of mindful awareness is referring to, where you're becoming more aware in the present moment with no judgment, noticing your thoughts, your feelings, and being more curious and being a witness to them. 
And then we go to connect where we cultivate our sense of interconnectedness and our shared humanity and increase our self-compassion and compassion. And we open then into an open monitoring awareness that allows us to express our dance and to hear the dance of someone else. These different states of peace help us to feel safe, secure, seen, and then our ability to serve each other. Another acronym that's prevalent in the contemplative practices world is STOP. Just means stop whatever is happening, your flooding, your anxiety, your concern, your confusion. Take a breath, observe, and then proceed. Now, each of these states has been rigorously studied over the last 60 years to be aspects of our neuroplasticity that then can create our character and support our ability to uphold our aspirational goals and to have traits in our behaviors and in our actions that are listed in that third column, to be pro-social, to have more equanimity in the face of complexity, to be more altruistic, to have more compassion, and to be ethical. The states become traits through practice. However, we all know that everything has an edge. Everything can be non-sustainable. For example, if I want to serve, but I serve to the point of burnout, then I've gone over the edge. Similarly, if I disrespect myself by trying to be calm in every situation, when in fact I might actually be tired or angry, I can feel the pain of disrespect. There can be pathological altruism where I am literally collapsing physically, psychologically, but I continue to give and give. Empathic distress is the one that's been researched the most, even here at Stanford at the uh, CARE program. And this is when we identify with the other who is suffering so much that we forget to stay connected to ourselves. And the distinction between compassion and empathy is that ability to hold on to yourself while being caring towards another. And then moral suffering is a whole complex phenomenon of having to bear witness over and over to atrocities of other people's behavior. When we have to be at those edge states at a chronic level, it changes us physiologically. This is where the stress-related illnesses have been well documented. And the goal of this workshop is not to restate stress-related illnesses. It's to move past that point and use this knowledge, which is well established, to then come up with what do you do each day to care for yourself so that you don't become the person who's over the edge. We know that when we are under chronic stress, the amygdala becomes hyperreactive. We become too quick to feel a sense of anxiety and catastrophe. And this is the signal of trauma, whether it's acute trauma or chronic trauma. The physiological changes that shape our nervous system then can contribute to our being the perpetrators of the behaviors that create suffering. If we're always in a fear state or we're always rushed and feeling threatened, our ability to pause and hear someone else's dance is diminished. Also, our ability to connect with our prefrontal cortex where we packed away all the wisdom such as the facts and knowledge you gain today, it can go offline in a minute if you're tired, hungry, and feeling hostile. Coming back to the nautical metaphor, the headwinds in this journey have names, oppression, discrimination, prejudice, bias. Bias is universal. Everyone who's spoken today has made that comment. But the beauty of neuroplasticity is that bias can be revealed and modified. We can meet our own bias and modify it. Prejudice is bias imposed onto a person or a group of people. Discrimination is when the action is added to the prejudice, and oppression is when it's at the systemic level. You may all be familiar with these terms, but I've found over the years these terms are used widely, but not everybody has clear understanding of their distinction. In resilience work, 
we begin by learning our own biases and reducing them so that we can prevent our unconscious or conscious contribution to these actions of prejudice, discrimination, and oppression. When we asked you to consider which social categories you identified, the ones that you didn't even notice are most likely part of your tailwind. We just heard an inspiring talk about physical disability. Those who have full physical ability usually don't include that in their three that they pick to describe because it's taken for granted. The fact that you could get into this room, that you could mobily move and sit in the chair and listen to this talk and see my slides are all things that many of us take as just a given. This is one way that we can heighten our insight to this word privilege. Privilege is something that we've been able to just take for granted, that we haven't had to learn about. We're all carrying a complex set of privileges. It's not narrow to just socioeconomic status or gender or race. It has to do with every aspect of participating in a community. So now I invite you to do another activity. This is again just in your own mind. But ask yourself, what are two tailwinds that are happening for you in your life right now? What's something that just works? Something simple. I turn on my computer and my email is there. That's a tailwind. It's something very mundane, simple example. But other tailwinds is I know that when I go home, no one will have broken into my house. That's a huge tailwind. It's a privilege to live in a neighborhood where I don't all day have to worry that my home will be robbed. So take a moment. What are two tailwinds in your life? Think of one that is an externality, like the examples I gave, and then an internality. I can trust myself to be honest. That is a tailwind. My own integrity is something that supports me. Now let's leave the tailwinds and go to the headwinds. What are two headwinds in your life right now? Simple almost ridiculous example, it's really hard to find parking in the middle of the day near this building. That's a headwind. Simple one, externality. Headwind, I don't know who my audience is going to be for this workshop. How complex should it be? How basic should it be? Part of the breakdown of community is that we don't know who we are going to get to interact with in a day. Think about what your headwinds are, externalities, internalities. Now, the reason we're doing this is because when you show up at the dance, these headwinds and tailwinds are showing up with you. And if you know what they are, you'll be more aware of how you are predisposed to just discard certain aspects of the conversation or to really highlight other aspects of the conversation. This level of self-awareness is what equips our ability to reach our goals in this field. Now, sometimes when we meet the tailwinds and the headwinds, it hurts, both tailwinds and headwinds. I can feel pain, even as I share that I don't have to worry that my home's gonna be broken into, I know people who are worried that their home is being broken into. And I feel the pain of that. So an act that we can engage in every day, even for three breaths, is am I being kind towards myself while I experience what I'm feeling? Can I breathe in that feeling and offer a gesture of a kind attitude can I acknowledge that the headwind is hard for me? I spent some time last night tweaking my slides. You know, or how much should I do this? How much should I do that? Simple headwind, I'm honored and delighted to be included in the community of presenters today. I give that example because it's something most of us can identify with. 
How will I know who I'm trying to relate to? But this would be hard for anyone, my common humanity. So these are the ways that self-compassion shows up in our inner dialogue. It's not a complicated, rarefied, esoteric practice that you do on a meditation cushion. You do it while you're brushing your teeth. Am I brushing my teeth in a way that I would brush my teeth, uh, the teeth of my child? Or am I aggressive and rough with that movement? These are gestures of self-compassion. This slide comes from the National Institute for the uh, Application of Behavioral Medicine. And it's a good slide, and that's why I'm using it, because it separates different practices for self-care and resilience that deal more with the sensory motor aspects of trauma and then with the cognitive aspects of trauma. Trauma is a broadly used term. In this context, I'm referring to anything that has been a headwind. And the key takeaway from this is that we need bottom-up practices that deal with the body and top-down practices that deal with the mind or the cognitive patterning. And many people consider the spirit to be where the two are interconnecting. This is an interesting research study that was published several years ago, but it's worth including here because it highlights the fact that if I walk into a room where the dance and the music is not the one I recognize or feel at home in, that's a situation that is going to foster a response and I will have an attentional deployment as well as a cognitive deployment or change. My attentional deployment is going to come from my body. I feel awkward. I feel frightened. I feel butterflies in my stomach. My hands start sweating because I don't feel that I belong. My mind will start scanning and say, oh gosh, they're all wearing that kind of clothes and I don't have those clothes on and that's a cognitive map that orients me that helps me to feel safe or unsafe. So my point here is that we have two processes that happen in response to every stimulus. The beauty is that those processes have been studied thoroughly and they're summarized in the research around the SAM system or the HPA system and most beautifully, is that they both get triggered at the same time, but one can keep on happening. The HPA system can just hang out there at that elevated level for a long time. And that's the more physiological based system. So the contemplative practices have risen in their attention in the research community and certainly in the population's adoption of them because they help us with that response, that visceral response. Cognitive behavioral therapy has been well documented to help us with our cognitive response. But if we can blend the two, then we enhance our resilience. So wise, compassionate hope is rooted in this blended approach of some visceral skills, breathing, movement, body scanning, mindful awareness of your senses, as well as training the mental map or the prefrontal cortex knowledge that we call our cognitive assets. Resilience, resilience is the fuel for hope because it is how we get to express our wisdom through our compassionate words and actions towards ourselves and towards others day after day after day. It's not a once and done process as we know when we look at the history. Dr. Valentine's slides this morning, we're talking about the progress that's been made over time. There's a lot of good news that fuels the validity of using the word hope. There also are miles to go and promises to keep. Wisdom ways of knowing and being is that wisdom is not knowing more, but knowing with more of you, using more aspects of yourself to know more deeply, to feel into the experience of the moment, as well as think through the experience of the moment. Wisdom has the dimension of the mind, body, and spirit all being integrated. If I had shown this slide 100 years ago, there would have been certain responses. 
Notice what your response is in this moment when you see these hands helding one another. When we see with awareness, we're able to actively engage in the neuroplasticity process and to consciously evolve our own attitudes. The more recent work on race perception has revealed that different sections of the brain and the nervous system are at play when we come to our conclusions in response to a stimulus. We already know that the amygdala is where basically the smoke alarm has just gone off all the time in response to everything and you're just in a state of anxiety and fear. But what's beautiful in this work on recognizing what parts of the brain are responding when images of different ethnic and racial identity are put before the participants is that it showed that these areas of automatic and rapid response can be regulated and overruled by the areas that detect conflict and regulate negative gut responses or knee-jerk responses. So in the contemplative practices, it's been shown that these areas of the anterior cingulate cortex and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex can be grown. You can have more gray matter there by practicing pausing and noticing how you respond to the stimulus. You can hardwire the connection to your prefrontal, prefrontal cortex so you have access to your knowledge and your wisdom. So this is really good news for matters like the goals of greater belonging, inclusion, and equity. Resilience practices open the space between the stimulus and the reaction. They reduce the amygdala-based and FFA-based behaviors. They cultivate responsibility. Think about the root of that word. The ability to respond is a responsibility that we can cultivate. So we're gonna do another activity, another interactive activity within your own thoughts and emotions. I'm gonna show you a series of images. They're going to be images of people's eyes but we'll do a practice session here. Just notice what your response is to what you're seeing. Notice how your body feels. What are the muscles around your navel feeling? How is your breath? What's your jaw feel like? What's the temperature in your hands? Just notice what thoughts come to mind, what story gets unleashed, what narrative, commentary. I'm going to go through the images very quickly because in the research that I'll be sharing, that's how it was done. So you'll see very quickly a series of eyes and just notice your response. Before I share the research, I'm gonna share a quote from Viktor Frankl, who you know survived the Holocaust and wrote Man's Search for Meaning. In it, he wrote, between stimulus and response, there is a space and in that space, lies our power and our freedom. FMRIs were not even in the imagination of science when he wrote this. We're now gonna do an activity with more time, with more space between the stimulus and response. Notice how you feel, what you think, when you have more time So Cunningham published this work showing that when people were shown faces rapidly and then when they were given more time, their inclination to be negative, to be prejudiced, to be discriminatory went up when it was fast and down when they had more time. So it might sound like a cute phrase to say the power of the pause, there's rigorous science showing that different aspects of our neurocircuitry is engaged when we take a moment, when we take a breath, when we pause. Not only in the action of a day, but in the arc of a week 
The Sabbath used to be the name for the big pause. In medical careers, the sabbatical, academic careers, the seven-year big pause. Ask yourself how you create the pause in your life. Dr. Valentine also referenced this Nobel Prize uh, winning work of Daniel K Kahneman. And here, just to unpack the point a little further, you see that in the fast thinking, we're constantly scanning our envi environment. That primitive limbic brain response to the reptilian brain sense of threat is all on. The amygdala says, danger, danger. Two more emails came in. Oh my gosh, there must be a problem. And the mind just is on this fast-paced, frightening-based mode of thinking. And we're more likely to make errors, not just errors in how we spell something or how we compute something, but how we look at someone or how we speak to them or whether we actually make the time to come to a workshop like this. These impulsive reactions are where the biases stay stuck and get deepened by consciously creating time for slowing the thinking, we get to reconstruct, remodel our nervous system and the biases in the frontal cortex in their cognitions. You can do it for complex problems, like how am I going to make a goal for myself by the end of this workshop where I actually change something in my life so I am contributing to greater inclusion and belonging and equity. So the deep, slow thinking is essential for complex problems. There's a lot of writing now about how undergraduate education is equipping people for simple problems because everything's done so quickly and learning is done so quickly that a lot of young adults don't really know how to step toward the complex problems. Here's just the same information, very simple uh, graphics since we're all used to these kind of emoji style ways of communicating with each other. The beauty that I wanna highlight is that the system two thinking is reliable and it's essential for complex decisions. Remember, even the sun takes downtime. So here's an example of a video of how this can look if you're a clinician, how you might take a pause. Before seeing the next patient. Take a deep breath. When you touch base with, with, maybe it's just your computer if you don't have an office, it's just that prompt of a physical, tangible cue that says, all right, I'm going to take the slow breath. I'm going to recalibrate. Because this will help us to stop that striving, driving, analytical mind that is quick firing and help us to prevent mistakes and open into presence. Listen to the rhythm of this piece. Many of you will recognize it. Brahms lullaby. Now take your index finger of your left hand and put it on the pulse of your right wrist. What is the pulse of your body right now? Don't count it, but feel if it's faster or slower than this rhythm. This rhythm is 60 beats per minute. 60 beats per minute is the healthy resting heart rate of an adult. Often my mind is going faster than this rate. The slow thinking would be in rhythm with this rate. But how many times today have I already needed to talk like this and go much faster than this rate because my nervous system is being asked to do so? So noticing that contrast is a way that we wake up to what's happening in our daily lives and we're able to make a difference. Now, when we have unresolved pain, trauma, difficulties, we can get stuck in hyper reactivity or complete burnout and depression. 
I want to give another rhythm to help us see what it feels like to be in this traumatizing pace day in and day out. Mm, missing that rhythm, excuse me, but it was like that fast beat. 120 beats per minute is what I'm talking like this when I'm talking really fast and trying to get a lot done and show you that I'm really smart because I can form all these words and these sentences. Notice when you're functioning that way and then make the contrast. Now let's think about a staff meeting or a team meeting or a huddle. How do we create community and bring in the dance, the rhythm of everyone? I'm gonna play a little piece of music called jamming. When you were in your last staff meeting, were you jamming? Were you playing yeah. off of the tempo and the musical thread that that person's voice and intention brought into the conversation? Right. These are words, but we have to feel it in our body for it to actually stay with us in the most difficult situation. So if someone is talking rapidly, how can I join their rapid rate and then shift into a slower rate to invite them into my dance? so that I can go back and forth and jam like any good improv group is working together. And this is what belonging feels like, that everyone is feeling heard and responded to. There's some acts of great wise courage that I'd like to just highlight. Um, this book by Nicholas Christakis out of Yale, titled Blueprint, published last year, is a chronology of the history of the evolution towards more inclusivity, more diversity, being recognized and celebrated, all the things that are making um, progress. And then relatively recently, an Italian court actually ruled that if food is stolen, not as a crime, but for hunger, it will, be not, it will not be punished as a crime. That's the ability to step towards complexity. We have to gather examples so that when we're facing a complexity, we don't feel alone, but we feel encouraged by the examples that others have done before us so that I can step toward the complexity. I can see you and offer wise compassion. I can pick up the burden and step forward to bring more solution. The practice of compassion meditation helps to cultivate the moral courage and wise action in the face of challenges. Some of you know the story of Hugh Thompson, who was a helicopter pilot in the Malay massacre, massacre. And you may know that he saw something's wrong here. In fact, he says, he said, it looks like there's an awful lot of unnecessary killing. This is what was on his radio recording. Something ain't going right about this. There's bodies everywhere. He flew his helicopter down into the face of fire, which was coming from his fellow soldiers, in order to bring on board the women and children who were being slaughtered. His moral courage is something that I hold in my mind as exemplary and nourishment that helps me if I'm facing a situation that calls for moral courage, or when, not if, when I'm facing it. Ask yourself, who do you hold in your mind? It can be someone who you, you know, met today. It doesn't have to be a figure that is in the news or in history. It can be someone who wrote an email that stood by you, that really saw the situation and spoke to it. And thank that person and recognize that person as an exemplary, moral, courageous individual that you can carry with you so that when you're frightened or stuck or confused, you know that people can behave with moral courage. Now, what undermines all this? There's another part of the nervous system that's often referred to as the neuro five. And this is where the dopamine of the strive, drive, analytical mind is gone haywire, where power, profit, pleasure, permanency, and pride are just an addiction. And we all have seen this. We've even maybe tasted it a little bit ourselves. And we have to, again, notice our individual body mechanisms that regulate us against that. If I feel lonely, but I got the Nobel Prize, then my oxytocin system is too low. My dopamine is way up there. So we have physiological mechanisms that help us to have checks and balances. 
Systemic mechanisms, the three areas of our government are meant to have this regulatory checks and balance process within an institution. We strive to have policies and practices so that we don't just let the neuro five take over. We can all think in terms of those three circles. Is there adequate security and appropriate level of cortisol? Is there adequate dopamine and safety? And is there adequate connection and soothing with the oxytocin circle? Contemplative practices reveal as well as change the way we think. Albert Einstein famously said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Meditation, a reflective journaling practice, help us to become aware of our thoughts and feelings. This awareness can prevent us from unconsciously expressing our biases or our stuck unresolved emotions from unhealed trauma. In fact, it can help us to not engage in acts of prejudice, discrimination, and oppression. We're going to do an activity now. Tomorrow will be an hour of doing activities, but I wanted to include one activity together in this hour. So I invite you to turn to a person next to you, facing them as your partner. And if you don't have somebody right next to you, just stand up and move, please, and get a partner. It really doesn't work so well in threesomes because you want to be looking at someone. And as you settle into your practice activity, you want to allow yourself to look at somewhere between this level of their body and this level of their body. If you don't want to look right into their eyes, that's perfectly fine. Just look somewhere in the region of their face because many of us are not comfortable with direct eye contact. So honor that in yourself, but give the person the sense that you're, you're looking at them. You're not looking out at the side. So now looking at the person, sitting comfortably, facing the person, turn your body. This activity is an activity to help us to experience our common humanity. Let your face relax. We tend to smile when we feel uneasy and it's a gracious gesture, but we also can have a softness in our face that shows a sense of safety, a sense of I belong, you belong. The intention of this practice is to create that sense that I belong, you belong. If you laugh in response to my prompts, let that happen. If you tear up, let that happen. Just let yourself be with your authentic experience. Begin by noting that I was born and this person was born just like me. This person arrived in this world, leaving the water, coming into the air and let out a whale, their first breath. This person was swaddled in warmth and given into the arms of someone this person was nourished in body, in touch. This person was taken into a community just like me. This person was offered objects just like me. This person was curious about those objects just like me. This person began to learn just like me. This person was given opportunities to be taught just like me. This person had favorite toys just like me. This person lost toys just like me. This person made friends just like me. This person lost friends just like me. This person went out into the larger world to expand their education just like me. This person developed beliefs and attitudes just like me. 
This person developed affections, attachments, aversions, dislikes, just like me. This person fell in love, just like me. This person lost someone they loved, just like me. This person set aspirations for their life, just like me. This person realized their aspiration to get a job at Stanford, just like me. This person learned of this inclusion program, just like me. This person in their day planning for today chose to be here now, just like me. Now look at this person and give them a smile of gratitude and then come back to join the group. And just notice, notice how it feels to acknowledge one another, to create the experience of belonging and how simple it can be in how we do that. That practice you can do even passively. I've done it in an airplane. I flew on Christmas Day this year, and the plane was half filled by children under the age of six. <laughs> it was a flying family occasion, and it was amazing in so many beautiful ways and challenging ways. And the Just Like Me practice helped me when a child would cry or scramble over me to try to get to something. <laughs> and this was just a beautiful way to stay open-hearted and resilient in that situation. This beautiful quote by George Washington Carver I share with you, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and strong because someday in your life, you will have been all of these. Let's do another activity about inclusion. When we look at this concept of inclusion, and we've just finished this Just Like Me Common Humanity activity, I'm going to highlight what some of the universal needs are. And I'm going to go a little past three because we started a little past three. So bear with me, thank you. So we all have these universal needs, which I'm not going to read in the interest of time, but these are widely recognized as fundamental needs for feeling well and included. <clears throat> now, which two do I need more of? And which two do I give less frequently than I could? Again, answer privately to yourself. What are you hungry for? What do you feel has been neglected toward you? And what can you honestly acknowledge and hold yourself accountable that you're not as generous in giving as you could be? These personal acts of accountability and awareness are what help us to make the progress that we all celebrate. When Dr. Valentine shows the progress, when we hear about the progress in our community or in our nation or in the world, recall that it is these small moments of offering inclusion to another that are the foundation for that progress. So let's do a sample plan. We're gonna end our time together by making a plan. And I'm gonna start at the macro level for a sample plan around inclusivity that needs moral courage. Things that I might ask myself are, do I use language that's inclusive? Do I acknowledge pronouns accurately would be an example of language. Am I pluralistic in my examples? Who do I not include right now? What thoughts and emotions do I have that have been my barriers to including others that are not included now? What actions and daily practices do I need to engage in to resolve those barriers that lie within me and what actions and practices do I engage in that will create solutions on the systemic level to remove the barriers for inclusion? Now, practices are not only these contemplative practices. We live in a body, and the body needs the care 
of being included in what the mind aspires to. So rest is fundamental. It's not just something to laugh about that you didn't get enough sleep. Your likelihood to be prejudiced and discriminating is greater when you're tired because when you're tired, your mind feels threatened. And so you're gonna make quick decisions. So sleep is essential for the evolution towards the social good. Sleep and rest help us to stay functioning on all the levels of the body. The vagal tone, there was a wonderful talk at one of the Department of Medicine uh, staff, all staff meetings about uh, pelvic floor disorders and GI disorders just because of vagal tone uh, abnormalities and the, the vagal nerve loves its sleep. So on to, to uh, ways that we rest, just opening the body, literally taking your body when you get home. Sometimes, you know, Adam, who I live with, will laugh at me because he'll say, what are you doing lying on the floor, you know, in your work clothes? And I've just, it's been a hard day and I just lie down, spread eagle. And then I start the home life because that spread eagle moment helps me to be more open hearted. So there are lots of ways we do this. Chewing, we talk a lot about what we eat but we don't talk enough about how we eat. The research has shown that when we chew 50 chews per bite, our serotonin goes up. And other research on race and ethnicity and discrimination has shown that when our serotonin level is up, we're less prejudiced. So chewing, we used to have the idiom, you know, I'll chew on that, when we would talk about a complex idea. It's a literal physiological process as well. I will create more space for the thought. I will literally chew the nourishment to my body so that I can take in the complexity. Higher levels of serotonin at the normal range, but adequate range, show that there is greater commitment to fairness and more aversion to harming others. Next, we come to the contemplation, which I've touched on, but I want to say that the befriending of the breath is always the baseline. And then befriending the body, doing a body scan, befriending your thoughts, your emotions, doing the shared humanity activity, and then specific meditations such as mindfulness, loving kindness, self-compassion, and compassion are all things that are offered in that one day Power of the Pause retreat and the annual summit of contemplation by design. And every single week in Windover, Thursdays 12 to 1, starting tomorrow, you can begin to nourish yourself that way. Moving on to the L in smiles, laugh, sing. It's a part of breathing. Do you sing in the shower? Do you sing in your car? Do you sing in a group? You know, singing used to be part of our daily lives and we don't do it a whole lot. Maybe we'll have to sing along for one of our staff meetings. Singing helps the breath and helps us to remember what it feels like to breathe deeply. Moving, you don't have to go to the gym, just move your body in some gentle way that feels good. Shake, bounce, swing, rotate, stretch, observe what your body needs. Like right now, just do what you want. Move your wrists, move your shoulders, move your neck, just move your body. That's the way to help it feel like you are kind toward it. Socialize, touch. There was a fascinating doctoral study or degree awarded for an individual who took all of McDonald's security videos from around the world and coded them for the number of times the people waiting in line touched each other. The United States McDonald's were really low. Brazil was really high. And touch, even when you touch yourself, helps to increase the serotonin and the oxytocin. So this is the way we can befriend ourselves. We're now gonna pass out seashells, which I actually collected when I was visiting my 90-year-old mother in Florida. And I knew I was going to be leading this uh, program today. And so I offer you just, there's gonna be two trays passed around right now. If you take a seashell and take the handout that's in the tray, and just since there's an abundance of them, feel free to take two and give one to someone in your work group who didn't come and tell them about the activity we're going to do. Take one shell, one handout, and I'm gonna explain what it's for. <clears throat> the shell has many symbolic meanings for the progress of humanity. A seashell 
is able to survive through currents, through storms, to travel around the whole world, to be in the seas, the seven seas that connect the planet. The seashell also is the home to a living organism. In the history in which Homo sapiens became the dominant species, it began because of seashell beds in which humans worked collaboratively and imagined a culture. In our goals as a department, we're imagining a culture of greater diversity and inclusion, equity, and belonging. So I give you this physical object as a way that you can have a reminder of what you intend for yourself in this regard. And as you look at this physical object, wherever you have it, you can keep it in your pocket or put it on your desk, that you think about your dance, your tempo, your home, your values that you will carry with you as you travel the uncharted waters of the complex topic of greater inclusion and diversity. The handout is your opportunity to set a specific goal. We're not going to take time for you to write this out right now. Feel free to email me at tiarich at stanford.edu if you want for feedback on your action plan. But the action plan is organized where it summarizes everything at a high level that we covered and gives you the opportunity to choose one because we all know from behavioral science that you can only move one step at a time towards a goal. You can't move the whole staircase. So pick one out of these four categories and then write a good, uh, and then I just broke out that the contemplative practices have the second acronym of pause, exhale, attend, connect, and express. And then like we do every year in our performance uh, evaluations, make a SMART goal. Specific, measurable, attainable, you know, the whole dance. Here we have that as a template that you can fill out so that you can take your goal and make it realizable for a month and for inclusion 2021. We can all celebrate the goals that were achieved over the arc of the year. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at Windover and I thank you for your participation in this workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Just, I know we are kind of at the end of time. Maybe um, will you be around for a moment? If yes. people, just because of the, um, we're running a little late because we started a little late, but Tia will stay around a little bit if any of you want to ask her anything or have questions. Hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow as well. And just again, um, Thank you so much to everyone who helped with making today possible and for all of our wonderful speakers. Uh, I hope you're going to all run out and sign up for one of these day long power of the pause uh, sessions that Tia runs because I'm telling you they are fantastic and really worthwhile and uh, is truly in the almost five years I've worked at Stanford. It's the only time I've broken my own rule about never commute to Stanford on a weekend. Uh, because I get tired of commuting during the week. But for that day, that was just a tremendous day. So I'm just going to shamelessly plug it and, um, you know, tell you more about it. So anyway, if you haven't had a minute to just take a look at our equity wall today, please do that. Uh, we have stickies if you want to add anything to the wall. And we will be turning some of these ideas into action. So thank you again for your commitment to what we're trying to do here. It's just a privilege and an honor to um, have spent the day with all of you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.